Hello everyone and welcome to this second video on some thoughts on skill and strategy. In this video I will be going through some more advanced concepts like adapting and bluffing because if you watched the first video and I really recommend that you do before going through this one um, this is where we ended up um, with basically mechanics is bigger than strategy because at low levels of skill the advantage that you get from having a complex strategy are really minor compared to um, other things like economy and just basic mechanics like controlling your units making sure that you're always building stuff and spending your resources and things like that now for a game like poker the mechanics is obviously um, really quickly learned because most clients make it really easy for you to lose all your money basically um, we're in a game like Starcraft um, even the top level of pros don't really uh, get to the point where mechanics are less important because they're such a vital part of the game um, for a game where um, it's pure strategy like Go for instance um, the controls are uh, basically non-existent or they're not part of the challenge of the game um, so first the easy part um, focus on mechanics focus on economy because that's where your biggest edge comes in the um, in the lower levels of skill basically um, if you watch someone who's uh, obviously amazing at the mechanics play a low level game they can buy um, if you're playing something like Dota you can buy basically any item because someone who's skilled enough will still um, make sure that he has a big enough advantage regardless of what hero or what units they are building um, so for the first more advanced concept um, adapting is probably the first thing you will run into and I touched briefly on this in the first video as well um, basically what it, this means is that if you're starting out and you have your simple you have one strategy strategy this means that as soon as you get interrupted um, you will start to drift, drift away from your strategy and start to do something else that you may or may not be as comfortable with um, so the basic part of adapting means that uh, even though you might have to do smaller adjustments to your build like in this case for instance um, you're being attacked by a banshee I'll draw in white instead um, but instead of changing your entire build you may just want to uh, put out one queen extra or adding one single spore crawler you know really small things but then eventually you will get back to your uh, your original strategy um, I just grabbed the screenshots I'm not really sure what the strategy is in this case but let's say you're doing something that was standard in uh, in the games I played which was like circling baneling um, corruptor for instance no what are they called the casters uh, infester that's right so circling baneling infester into ultra lisk let's say um, so for every mineral that you spend on something that's not part of your own strategy you're basically playing the game that your opponent wants you to play um, let's say in this case um, the Terran is going to expand super early so he's building a banshee which forces you to build defenses instead then it allows him to expand and basically keep you in your base for really small cost like a starport and let's say two or three banshees um, it's not negligible um, if you did just uh, you basically scared off the banshees and then just went and killed him you probably would have a pretty good um, a pretty good counter to his sort of tech heavy uh, early game so 
What I mean with this adapting, like the first thing you should learn while you're doing your your one strategy is to basically deviate and then come back. So you have your early, early, you have your mid game, and you have your late game. Basically, what this means is that you have a few different specified points. Like at this point in the game, I want my units and I want my tech to look like this. So this means that even though you may branch off in the early game, depending on what your opponent is doing, uh, expanding, attack, or defending, for instance, um, you will still get back to your mid game and you will, even though you branch out later, you will still get back to your late game. Which means that uh, you basically won't uh, end up with weird unit compositions and weird tech or just a low number of bases for instance um, basically playing to your own strengths instead of uh, playing to your opponent's strength and the second part of this is information and adjustment um, basically what to look for and what to change in a game like Starcraft it's easy to get in the habit of sending out a probe at uh, sending out your 11th probe or something like that. I haven't played the game for so long I really can't tell you the exact timings. I think a marine is something like three minutes um, and before that you're basically free to scout a turn. Um, so what to look for is basically the most important part because even though you may scout your opponent you don't unless you're good at that race or have played a bunch of different games against them. You really won't know what the information you're getting means, which basically defeats the purpose of scouting. I mean, sure, anyone who um, sends out an early scout will see either if it's A, early expand, or B, um, aggression, aggro, or C, if they are going tech. I mean, those three things whoops, are really easy to see if you're running up. If he has another base, obviously he's expanding. Um, because um, the earliest scout generally tends to give bad information. Because even though you might figure something out, um, adapting to whatever he's doing will take so long um, because you've obviously gone so far along one of these three paths already that you can't adjust um, to counter, basically. Um, which means that also the later into the game you go, um, the more important it is to scout because you have an easier way of reacting to whatever your opponent is doing. Um, taking bases or unit composition I mean, obviously, as the enemies grow bigger, you have a larger investment into your unit composition, um, which also means that it's more unlikely that the enemy, and you as well, will be able to change something. The exception to this is obviously the, the Zerg in StarCraft, which can uh, bunker up larva, basically. Um, they couldn't before, but now I think they can have basically infinity larva at every hatchery. Um, which means that it, as long as they have um, the economy they can basically build whatever they want in uh, reaction to what the opponent is attacking them with. Um, it's just the build time that stops them. Um, so there are a few uh, cool examples of this. Um, obviously the more mobile you are the bigger um, the units will uh, impact how the game plays. Like, if you have something that's really set in concrete and you have a bunch of minerals invested into your army and it's a slow-moving army, the enemy will tend to have to uh, basically drop or stuff like that to uh, reduce your economy because they can't take on full-on aggression, so they have to keep moving around bases and things like that, which means that they basically send in one unit at a time to make sure that your enemy is still in the same place. Um, small things like that. Um, 
So there are a bunch of people who scout even though they may not know what to do with the information. Like how many gases do, does my opponent have at minute X for instance. Which may not tell you much unless you're extremely good at the game. And know exactly what different builds uh, entail. Um, the next part is getting and keeping advantages. Which is really something that pro players are much better at because they understand the concept and sort of middling players do not. Um, because getting ahead and staying ahead is actually a hard thing to do. Obviously if you get ahead, um, as you can see in this case, it tends not to be such a big deal um, at the extreme beginning. Like up until here it's pretty close in this case. And then it basically just spirals out of control. Um, which means that um, someone who got an early advantage basically made sure that they used the advantage to further their own advantage. Because if you look at something like a, an amateur game, the graphs will tend to basically jump up and down more um, unless the t teams are completely even. Because players at low levels are so bad at realizing what their advantage is. Um, in this case it's from Dota 2 obviously. Um, and what the players in Dota 2 tend to do is that if you get a few early kills you try to just keep getting kills because you think that it's the best way to win. But the thing is that um, if you get early kills this um, basically increases your farm area because you're safer further away from your base and the best way to uh, increase your advantage is to farm more than your opponent does uh, which will lead to graphs like this. It's the same in StarCraft. Um, if you win a big team fight against your opponent where you're uh, Let's say you have 200 supply each, you end up with 100 and your opponent has 50. Um, and you can say this is just uh, workers and you have the similar amount of workers. The best way to win is not actually to attack him in most cases. I mean obviously if they only have workers it's pretty easy to win. But in less extreme cases, if you win big um, focusing on your economy is a better way to win late in the game but what most people t tend to do, most bad people, is to try and win right now because they think that their army advantage is bigger than um, basically the defender's uh, home turf advantage with, which is um, generally a faster reinforcement path and better set up structures for defending as well as choke points and terrain and stuff like that. Um, so uh, getting ahead and staying ahead is really important in a game like StarCraft. Um, obviously Dota 2 is different because of how the heroes work. Um, carries for instance uh, are heroes that tend to uh, do better with lots of gold which means that um, basically the longer the game goes on the more likely they are to have those items that make them stronger. Um, but heroes that are good early um, obviously um, rely more on the skills and not so much um, the items. Like if you have a skill that does high base damage but doesn't scale at all it's better early in the game. Um, some heroes like um, Undying, for instance, um, is a really good early game hero. Uh, I had one more point, what was it? Uh, yeah, obviously you can make entire team compositions in Dota around winning at a certain point in the game, which means that you have more early game heroes, for instance, which then means that the longer your opponent holds out the better it is for them because they have uh, greater scaling but in most cases these days in competitive games 
the, um, the team compositions for the entire team tend to be uh, fairly well balanced in that both teams have a couple of carries that do well with items they have a couple of supports that don't really need items and then they have something like a ganking hero or a good initiator that revolves a lot about um, basically staying out of team fights and uh, keeping the opponent from ganking you uh, controlled stuff like that um, so getting gaining and keeping advantages is really important just like um, getting uh, or reducing enemy advantages and um, getting basically getting the graph back to zero uh, which is also um, something that pro gamers tend to focus more on because if you're playing a game uh, in Dota where your game is basically snowballing out of control it's really easy for most players to just say oh my team is bad because I'm playing with a bunch of noobs so they just ignore it and then they go idle for a bit in the base and then they play the next game because they don't really care we're in a pro game obviously the stakes are much higher and every game counts not everyone obviously but most of them um, the next concept is quite difficult to explain um, and it is opponent versus theory optimal um, this is obviously uh, a better example for this is poker um, let's say for instance you're playing against someone you know basically the opponent um, this means that against this specific player your actions will be different than they are from the theory optimal um, because theory optimal basically says that you're going to have certain ranges of cards where um, you need to play let's say you have you have a pair of aces which is obviously a good hand um, and to make sure that players pay you off when you raise with aces you also need to raise with bad hands um, because if you played poker and every round or every hand was just the be the guy with the best hand raises and everyone else folds obviously the game would um, be pointless because everyone would just win when they get the cards and they would lose th when they get bad cards and the money would only go to the house so this basically is the concept around the entire game of poker um, because to make sure that you get paid off you need to play bad hands as well but um, if you have a hand like a pair of sevens for instance um, you might need to call with a few hands as well just to make sure that you um, if you have a hand uh, let's say a suited ace you have ace five clubs uh, so you have a suited hand then you all um, so you have your super good hands this is a star and then you have trashy hands you have two five um, so if you get three bet when you raise let's say you only raise to steal the blinds in every case here so if you raise with aces and you steal the blinds you're obviously unhappy because you want to play it against uh, a weaker hand and make more money but if you if you raise with two five um, and get the blinds you're obviously very happy because you get money with a hand that isn't supposed to make any so that means that you're playing theory optimal basically you're raising with a bad hand because you want to get value on your good hands but if you're just playing opponent optimal um, let's say you have someone who never folds his big blind for instance you're not going to want to raise this hand but you will definitely still want to raise the aces because you know that he will always defend um, you can also do things like raise with a pair of sevens and hope to hit a set because um, if he never folds you're likely to get paid off which means the odds I think it's something like 11 or 12 to 1 um, so the odds of hitting your set um, 
are basically paid back by the fact that you're going to win more money uh, if your opponent is um, defending all the time. Um, and this also means, like in a game of StarCraft for instance, if you have a lot of history with a player, you're more likely to know um, how the games will look so that you can play differently um, with an entirely different strategy from how you would play against an unknown player. Um, let's say for instance you're somewhere in the mid-range of players and you jump into a matchmaking uh, game of uh, StarCraft. You will basically have no idea about how your opponent plays because you will only ever play against the same guy once um, and then never again see them or at least for enough games that you won't know what they're uh, likely to do. So against someone unknown you will have to play more towards theory optimal than if you're playing someone who is known. And obviously the higher um, your skill gets the more likely you're, uh, you are to play against opponents you've played against before because there's just a smaller numbers of number of players on the bell curve. Now, as far as aggression goes, there seems to be this weird sort of conclusion that all aggression is good because um, it obviously forces the opponent to react to what you're doing. But um, this is actually a sort of weird, uh, weird part of the concept because forcing mistakes and being aggressive are actually two different things. Uh, hello. Okay. Yeah, I have no idea what's happening to my Photoshop right now. Let's all ignore that and just focus on the aggression. Uh, because actually fo forcing mistakes is more important than being aggressive. Um, because you can actually force mistakes by being defensive as well. Let's say you're playing Dota 2 and you have your hero on low health um, and he's defending at a tower. But you know that you have, um, let's say, a global um, a global ally who can teleport in and help you or just help you from afar, like Zeus or Chen. Um, or you have an ally nearby who can stun an enemy who dives too far, for instance. Which means that um, being aggressive is stupid because uh, it obviously make, makes it easier for your opponent to kill you, but being defensive will be the move that forces the mistake. Um, and forcing mistakes is one way to get back from the, uh, the sort of deficit that I showed on this picture here. I'm just going to see if I can. I have no idea what's happening, but let's ignore that. It looks like the line tool. Bridge. Hello. Oh, whatever. But yeah, forcing mistakes is more important than aggression is. Um, in some cases, aggression is the way to force the mistakes. In some cases, defending is the way to force the mistakes. Like I said before, if you have a team composition in Dota 2 that is more likely to win late game, um, defending will tend to be the better option um, basically for the entire game because eventually you're just going to be so strong that it doesn't matter what you do and you can just steamroll. Um, so making sure that you're forcing your opponent to play out of his comfort zone and play to your strategy um, is more important than just being blindly aggressive, though in some cases being aggressive is obviously good. Um, the next part is even more rare in games because for uh, bluffing to be important uh, the game has to be mature basically. Um, like I said before uh, with the information slide um, you must both know um, all the strategies and what um, what what the build orders are and what the gas timings are and stuff like that. And your opponent must know that you know all this stuff as well, which is 
um, extremely rare in games that you can expect uh, both yourself and your opponent to be on that level. Um, like I have a slide here in the bottom. Um, I can't remember. I think it's from a really uh, famous tournament game, but I just took the slide off the internet. Um, but basically what he's doing here is that he knows that the overlord on the right hand side doesn't see uh, further than this and if you had an actual command center here um, he wouldn't see it. So the overlord moves in here and then he scouts and he sees that there are workers mining the minerals and then he just leaves again. Uh, which means that the time spent from the uh, SEVs moving over here I'm gonna see if it works. Yeah, it works again. Um, so the time spent investing in this bluff, uh, basically faking that you have expanded, um, the time spent mining or not mining in your main uh, is paid back by the fact that your opponent believes that you're not going to attack, basically. Because what happens is in this game is that he fakes the expansion, then he just builds a bunch of units, and then he steamrolls the Zerg. Uh, because the Zerg also expands when he sees this fake one. Um, so there are two things um, you must know and your opponent must know and um, it also has to be a game of incomplete information. Uh, a game like chess for instance would obviously be impossible to bluff in because the uh, opponent knows all your uh, all your moves um, so bluffing is a concept that I would like to see more in games but the problem with this is that you must have a game that is uh, multiple round um, if you're only playing each opponent once um, it's pretty much not going to matter unless it's something like a game um, where um, the counters to each strategy are vastly different um, but it's sort of a bad game design because it makes sure that early um, early decisions matter more than um, more matter more than the mechanics and the strategy of the mid and late game. Um, so it's extremely r rare to see in games and definitely in games that are played at a high level. So to incorporate bluffing into your game, um, I've given this a lot of thought but you must play in a bunch of rounds and I would say five is probably the least number of rounds like uh, first to three uh, best of five so whoever wins three games wins the game um, but for a game um, let's say you're playing Starcraft on the ladder for instance each game will probably be uh, let's say 15 or 20 minutes 15 or 20 minutes. So if you want to design a game that has a big bluffing element, you must also keep each of these rounds to uh, 3 to 5 minutes. And to have a strategy game that has a fairly decent strategy that plays out in 3 to 5 minutes is super hard. Um, I've given this some thought and I have uh, thought up a game that I will show in a later video, I think. Um, so that's it about bluffing. Um, I think it's a really cool concept, but again, as I've said, you must be so good that it's um, it's rarely an option in most games. Um, and ranges is the second part. I talked about this a bit on the um, theory optimal part, but this basically means that you can never always... <laughs> that's a stupid sentence. You can't always use the same strategy. Um, let's say for instance if you're known to never rush in a game of Starcraft um, you will your opponent will always expand basically because uh, he doesn't need to scout because he knows what you're doing so you need to have um, ranges you need to have an early attack you need to have an early expand and you need to have an early uh, tick um, because otherwise your opponent 
um, will know how to play perfectly against you without even scouting. So you're taking a game of incomplete information and basically turning it into a game of complete information by always doing the same thing. Um, this is again obviously only important in games where you play the same opponent uh, lots of times or where replays are easily available so that your strategy uh, crystallizes into something obvious. Um, in a game like poker, um, each hand is way faster than these three to five minutes, uh, probably along the lines of 30 seconds. Um, but the thing with poker is that you never, or not never, but you rarely get to see a showdown. Like, you rarely get to see what both players had. Um, because so much of poker is about betting and how the cards change depending on uh, what the board looks like and things like that. Um, so even though you may win a hand in poker, for instance, you might not learn anything about it because you never know what the opponent had. In something like StarCraft, you can always go back in and watch the replays to um, basically to make sure that your approximation of your opponent's range is more accurate. Um, so, yeah. Again, these are the sort of concepts that are only really useful at the extreme high levels of game, um, obviously depending on your game. Um, but I think they're still really, uh, really cool ideas. And as I've said, I've uh, given that a, this a bit of thought and I would kind of make my uh, sort of basic design and I will show it in a later video. Um, so this has been the second part of the strategy videos. In the next part I will um, I will basically go through these sort of concepts that I've shown in the first and second videos and basically um, show you how to incorporate them into your game to make sure that the players have an easier time of figuring out things like um, uh, different strategies, what strategies are good against other things, um, how to be selectively aggressive and force mistakes, um, what to scout and uh, what to look for, um, like all these different concepts that I've gone through and uh, basically make different sort of uh, easier learning tools to make sure that the players have a better experience moving from the lower levels of skill to the higher levels of skill. Uh, instead of playing just thousands of games, playing hundreds of games. Um, so just having the tools available to make sure that they can easier move on through the ranks, to make sure that they get a deeper, more satisfying experience playing your game. So this has been part two. Thanks for watching.